Welcome to Jerusalem Unplugged, the only podcast dedicated to Jerusalem, its history, and its people. Your host, Roberto Matza, will bring you guests discussing their relationship with the Holy City. A journey through history, society, feelings, and hopes for the future. Follow the podcast on all social media platforms at Jerusalem Unplugged. Dear Lord Rothschild, I have much pleasure in conveying to you on behalf of His Majesty's Government the following declaration of sympathy with Jewish Zionist aspirations, which has been submitted to and approved by the Cabinet. His Majesty's Government view with favour the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavours to facilitate the achievement of this object it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine, or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. I should be grateful if you would bring this declaration to the knowledge of the Zionist Federation. Yours sincerely, Arthur James Balfour. Hi, I am Roberto Mazza the host of Jerusalem Unplugged. In this podcast, we'll not only explore the fascinating history, politics, society, and incredible people of Jerusalem, but also unravel how this city plays a significant role on the global stage. Join me in uncovering the multifaceted stories that make Jerusalem a captivating force that resonates worldwide. Welcome to a special solo episode of Jerusalem Unplugged. I'm your host, Roberto Mazza, and today I'll be your host and storyteller as we are diving into a pivotal moment in history, the Balfour Declaration. Many of you asked about an episode, or more than one, dedicated to this very important document in the history of Jerusalem and Palestine. So in this episode, I'll be your guide through the intricacies of this landmark document that shaped the destiny of Palestine. And stay tuned for a comprehensive exploration setting the stage for our upcoming episode featuring insights from esteemed scholars, colleagues and friends who will lend their expertise to unravel the multiple dimensions of the Balfour Declaration. So get ready for this first episode into the past of the Balfour Declaration, its legacy and its history. Let's picture now the end of 1970. The world gripped by the horrors of World War I. The impending Russian Revolution, which eventually will change the picture and the geostrategic stage of the war. As imperial powers jockeyed for position, the Middle East emerged as a pivotal theater of strategic importance. And it's against this backdrop, the Zionist movement gained momentum spurred by the dream of a Jewish homeland. Historian James Renton said World War I was a time of geopolitical realignments. The British government, seeking allies, turned its attention to the Zionist movement, which by then had gained that momentum. It's crucial to understand that the Balfour Declaration didn't materialize in isolation. Rather, it was a piece in a broader puzzle that included agreements like the Hussein McMahon correspondence and the secretive Sykes Picot Agreement. So, before the ink touched the Balfour Declaration, a document that began to be produced early in April 1917, Secret understandings were shaping the Middle East. So let me talk briefly about the Hussein McMahon correspondence between the British government and Sharif Hussein of Mecca and Medina. As the British promised Arab independence, they actually promised a caliphate, a state, with specific borders at least in some geographical region, or what it could have been this Arab state, in exchange for an Arab revolt against the Ottoman Empire. 
Let me quote from T. Lawrence. The Usain Mekmaon correspondence fueled Arab aspirations for independence, a promise that seemed at odds with the later actions outlined in the sykes picot agreement, and I should add, outlined by the Balfour Declaration. But we probably should say that Lawrence uh, overplayed this idea of, of the uh, Arab revolt against the Ottoman Empire as fueled by Arab aspirations. We do have Arab revolts throughout the Ottoman Empire, particularly in modern-day Lebanon, in Syria, partly in Palestine. But we don't have the same rebellions as those promised by Sharif of Us Sharif Hussein of Mecca and Medina in the Gulf. So, what happened in this correspondence? It's a series of uh, commitments and promises which must be understood within the general context of World War I. First of all, we need to remember that Hussein, Sharif of Mecca and Medina, was an Ottoman subject and essentially an enemy. So the British were promising an enemy a land in return for a rebellion. A rebellion that effectively never really materialized as the British envisioned. But it was much more a gathering of tribes at the hands of the family of Usahin and eventually led by T. Lawrence, which somehow helped the British in the conquest of Palestine and Syria. They provided support, mostly through guerrilla, uh, but very much never materialized as a rebellion marked by what we may perceive as the criteria of, of Arab nationalism, thinking about Arab independence. We know from many sources that most of the tribes fighting alongside uh, uh, Lawrence were effectively interested in booty and compensation. Nevertheless, this is an important moment because, again, it's part of these dealings that the British are discussing with a variety of actors. And we also have to remember the timing. The Hussein Macmacon correspondence came about the time of the failure of the British invasion of Gallipoli, which was marked with the withdrawal of British forces led by Winston Churchill and later on with a major defeat in Mesopotamia at Kutel Amara, when the largest contingent of British soldiers were captured by the Ottomans and imprisoned as prisoners of war. So we have to understand this first sort of uh, agreement, bearing in mind the historical conditions of that particular period in time knowing also that both Usahin, his family, and the British at large couldn't have known what was going to happen next. So this has to be understood as a, an agreement, an exchange of letters in that particular moment in time. And this is true also for the sykes picot Agreement and later on for the Balfour Declaration. So, Behind the scenes of the Hussein Mekmaon correspondence, a different narrative was unfolding. The sykes picot Agreement, which was a clandestine deal between Britain and France, was meant to carve up the Middle East into spheres of influence, contradicting the promise made to Hussein. Mark Sykes, in 1916, said, The sykes picot Agreement was a geopolitical maneuver setting the stage for the post-war division of the Middle East, effectively denying the presence of a previous agreement with the Arabs, or at least those that felt represented by Usain. The sykes picot Agreement is an agreement that for a long time was uh, an object of discussions mostly amongst historians and students, uh, at in college, just discussing the period of World War I and trying to understand how the modern Middle East was created. But it was not certainly a common name 
in relation to the history of World War I in general. It's only later on, with the emergence of Daesh or ISIS, the self proclaimed Islamic State, when a number of fighters began to tear down the borders between Iraq and Syria, claiming that they were tearing down the borders set by the sykes picot agreement, that all of a sudden the larger public audience took an interest and media began to discuss the sykes picot agreement. It has to be said that as a secret agreement, the sykes picot was denounced in 1917 by the newly created uh, Soviet Union, so after the Russian Revolution, and eventually the agreement itself lost its validity. What is important and what is sort of a long-term legacy is the idea to divide the Middle East into first spheres of influence, and later on, as a result of historical events that unfolded, into new nation-states, which were created following the creation of the League of Nations and the attribution of the mandates to the mandatory powers of France and Great Britain. So then we have the creation of a map that can be almost overlapped with the maps provided by the Sykes-Picot Agreement, which in a sense tells us that those sphere of influences that were originally designed in 1916 existed throughout the end of the war and throughout all of the discussions that led to the creations of the mandate. So we have a French mandate over Syria and Lebanon and a British mandate over Iraq, Transjordan and Palestine. And we can think that the major difference between the Sykes-Picot Agreement and what happened next is very much in relation to Palestine. In the Sykes-Picot Agreement, Palestine was to become some sort of an international area which could have been ruled through a condominium, this is the word that was used, of different international actors. Barring the port of Haifa, the British wanted a Haifa which was meant to develop and eventually connect Haifa to Basra, and from Basra, another connection to India. So open these channels of communications uh, through the Mediterranean, by land, to India. So an alternative to the Suez Canal. But in our context, in order to understand also the relevance of the Balfour Declaration, we can see the major difference. Palestine was meant to become this international zone, and it was meant to be international because the British recognized the difficulties to rule holy places, in particular Christian holy places. But then, obviously, after the war, Palestine became a British mandate, and unique in its own nature, as British mandatory Palestine was ruled directly by Britain. So unlike all of the other mandates that saw the emergence of local government, Palestine remained ruled by Britain. So it's against this intricate backdrop the Balfour Declaration emerges. In 1917, amidst the chaos of World War I, British Foreign Secretary Arthur Balfour pens a letter to Lord Rothschild expressing sympathy for the Jewish Zionist aspirations and support for a national home in Palestine. Dear Lord Rothschild, I have much pleasure in conveying to you on behalf of His Majesty's Government the following declaration of sympathy with Jewish Zionist aspirations, which has been submitted to and approved by the Cabinet. His Majesty's Government view with favour the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object. It being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine, or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. I should be grateful if you would bring this declaration to the knowledge of the Zionist Federation. Yours sincerely, Arthur James. 
powerful. Before we delve into some of the analysis that I would like to share with you of the Balfour Declaration, allow me to share some uh, general points. This wasn't just a diplomatic move. It was part of a larger strategy to gain favor with the Zionist movement and secure global support, especially the United States. The motivations behind the Balfour Declarations are multifaceted, as we will see later. On one end, it served the British agenda by courting support uh, from the influential Zionist movement and countering German influence in the Middle East. So that it was also argued by Jonathan Schneer, the author of an important publication on the Balfour Declaration. Balfour and his contemporaries, he says, saw the declaration as a means to gain Jewish support for the Allied cause, especially in the United States, and also to counter German influence in the Middle East. On the other end, genuine belief existed among some British officials in the Zionist cause, viewing it as a historic and biblical obligation. And I will discuss this with a lot more details because this has been make in the making for a long time and as well for a long time, scholars did not really accept the idea that were like religious motivations behind the Balfour Declarations. But the times have changed and now there's a general acceptance that we have to also use religion as a set of lenses in order to understand the Balfour Declaration. Lawrence James, another historian, says, simultaneously, there was a genuine belief among some British officials in the Zionist cause, viewing it through the lens of biblical and historical ties. As the Balfour Declaration unfolded, events on the Ottoman front were pivotal. The Ottoman Empire, a central player in the conflict, faced challenges on multiple fronts, which eventually culminated with the invasions of the Ottoman Empire by the British forces through Egypt, led by General Allenby, first taking Gaza, then Jaffa, and then later on Jerusalem in December 1917. So the British calculated their moves considering the geopolitical chessboard and the aspirations of various factions. Eugene Rogan said the Balfour Declaration was part of a larger strategy, considering the Ottoman front and the shifting sense of alliances in the Middle East. Which also tells us that, as a strategy, could have worked in different ways. Unveiling the Balfour Declaration set off a cascade of reactions and controversies. Arab communities in Palestine vehemently opposed the idea, fearing displacement. The conflicting promises made by the British to both Arabs and Jews sow the seeds of tension that persist to this day. As Rashid Khalidi says, the Balfour Declaration marked the beginning of a complex and fraught relationship between Arabs and Jews in the region. It laid the foundation for a conflict that continues to shape the Middle East today. As we navigate the short-term and long-term legacies of the Balfour Declaration, its impact becomes more profound. In the short term, it reshaped geopolitics of the Middle East, and in particular of post-World War I Palestine. And in the long term, it played a decisive role in the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948. And of course, the question of the Palestinian refugees and so forth. Avi Schlein, and we will hear some of his comments in the second episode dedicated to the Balfour Declaration, said, the Balfour Declaration sowed the seeds of a complex web of the political, ethnic, and religious conflicts. Its impact reverberates through the decades, shaping the destiny of the Middle East. The consequences of the Balfour Declaration reached beyond the immediate aftermath of World War I. It influenced the geopolitical landscape, giving birth to a new era in the Middle East. It was even recognized by Mark Sykes when he said the consequences of our promises in the Balfour Declaration will be felt for generations. We are witnessing the birth of a new era in the Middle East. The Balfour Declaration stands as a testament to the complexities 
of geopolitics, strategic maneuvering, and the consequences of promises made during wartime. Consequences that had been paid for decades, in fact for a century, by people. So, I want to move now to the second part of this episode and share with you some general thoughts and analysis that I developed in the past 15 years or so, working on and teaching about the Balfour Declaration. Let me start with a general historical context, and I think this is very important to remember that the Balfour Declaration is part of wartime agreements and is a byproduct of World War I, particularly the byproduct of the late part of the war. 1917 was the watershed for the future of the war in many ways, with Russia withdrawing from the war following the Russian Revolution and also with the uh, uh, US, so American, uh, entry into the war. We also have large battles in Europe with massive casualties, which change the perspective and the perception about the war. Besides, it's important to remember that there is no clear picture in terms of outcomes. This is still a moment in history where, in fact, there were no speculation who might have won the war. Remember that Germany surrendered while still controlling French territory. So it's obvious that by 1917, things were unclear. We also have a Changes occurring, particularly in Britain, France, and Italy, where the prime ministers of all of these countries change their leadership. So, if we base our analysis of the Balfour Declaration just relying on this general context, we can move towards what I would call the traditional approaches towards the understanding of the Balfour Declaration and why was it issued. And I want to make a distinction here because what I want to talk about in the next few minutes of this first episode dedicated to the Balfour Declaration is the traditional approaches to understanding the Balfour Declaration and something that requires a little bit more of an effort and is an alternative approach, one that is complementary, not in opposition to the traditional approaches. So in general, we can think of the Balfour Declaration as a part of British strategic thinking. The British already clarified in previous documents and, in general, their interest about Palestine, particularly in order to control the route to India and control the Suez Canal. So the British would have control of the Suez Canal, which already did, but also control a traditional land route from Haifa in particular down to Iraq and then from Iraq, which was known obviously as Mesopotamia back then, essentially through Basra, to control this kind of uh, uh, alternative route to the Suez Canal. And indeed, a Palestine controlled by Jews, it basically meant a Palestine controlled by a friendly group of people. In Britain, Jews were understood, particularly by the elites, as almost British, almost Europeans, obviously they're Jewish, anti-Semitism is widely spread and understood in racial terms too, and therefore the Jews are almost British, almost white, we could say, and they have been in Europe for a long time, they understand obviously the languages, the culture, they are assimilated, and so they may become this friendly group of people that would run the region for the British. We also have to look at political arguments concerning, for instance, the attitude of the Jews in Russia and the United States. So, it was argued that Jews and Jewish elites and groups could affect the policy of these countries and politicians, for instance. Given that the understanding of many was that the Russian Revolution was led by Bolsheviks who had Jewish origin, many believed that promising Palestine to the Jews might have had an impact on their contribution to the war effort. In other words, many believed that perhaps the Russians, even under the Bolsheviks, could have stayed in the war and therefore help the British, the French, in their effort against Germany. It was also believed that 
American Jews would have pushed the United States to not only enter the war, which eventually they did, but also to step up their efforts in order to help the British and the French, particularly on the Western Front, and also the Italians in the uh, uh, front against Austria. Obviously, we need to understand that this belief is deeply rooted in misconceptions of the Jews and also in anti-Semitism. The belief was that the Jews are a nation, despite the fact that already uh, it was declared that Judaism was a religion. Uh, you know, this goes back with reference to the uh, late 1880s declaration of Baltimore, where Judaism was defined by American Jews as a religion and not a nationality. And this kind of thinking led to believe many British, in obviously politicians and in the elites, that convincing a few Jews would convince all of the others supporting the, uh, the war and the wartime effort. Similarly, it was believed that it was important to influence individuals like Louis Brandeis, which was a Supreme Court justice in America, who had access to President Wilson. So, once again, we have this kind of idea that you can promise a land for the Jews in Palestine in order to sway public opinion or to change the views of, in this case, of an individual. Uh, Louis Brandeis was not fully convinced uh, of, about Zionism and he had his own ideas, but certainly, you know, the idea of a Jewish uh, national home in Palestine was certainly appealing to him. And so the political argument is very much about the question of Jewish influence, which, as I said earlier, is also connected to anti-Semitism, to these century-old conspiracy theories for which the Jews in different ways controlled the world. It has also been argued that Germany was close to issue a similar declaration. The, for the British attempted to anticipate Germany. Germany certainly understood the value of its Jewish population, but it's also a way more complex situations. Um, German Jews were fighting uh, within the German army, uh, obviously as fully assimilated uh, uh, individuals. The Zionist organization was based in Germany, before moving to Switzerland at the beginning of the war. And Germany was also an allied of the Ottoman Empire. So there may have been attempts to somehow um, push the idea of a Jewish entity in Palestine or in the Ottoman Empire, but it was not certainly the same as making a promise like the British did to the Zionists. But it's been argued, material has always been very scanty, and so it's very hard to look into this idea of a similar uh, German declaration of sympathy, which could have led to the creation of a Jewish entity in Palestine. We also have to talk about myth, and this allows me to introduce a key figure, which is Chaim Weizmann. Chaim Weizmann, before becoming the first president of the State of Israel was a professor of chemistry, originally from Russia, who worked at the University of Manchester. In time, he became the leader of the British Zionist. And yet, even at the beginning of the war, despite obviously his prominent role in and within the Zionist movement, he was not yet a very key figure in dealing with the British cabinet. He didn't really have access to the echelons of the British government. However, as a professor of chemistry, he came up with a formula, um, the formula for acetone. Now, acetone was already produced and it was already uh, heavily used uh, during the war effort. It's a major component in uh, the uh, military industry for bomb banking, but it was not produced in industrial quantities. So what it did was to create this formula that would have allowed the British to produce massive quantity in a very uh, short period of time of acetone. And that's what really gave him access to the British government, because now he became an asset. He was obviously very important as he changed the ways in which uh, weapons were produced in Britain during World War I. 
The myth goes that uh, Balfour Declaration was a personal gift from Lloyd George to Dr. Weizmann, and this became actually a popular story at that time, one that Weizmann himself, uh, preposterously, I would say, uh, offered to a few uh, news outlets. The reality is that, however, that while obviously this is a myth, he gained access to the British government. And this is also the moment where you can see the presence of Weizmann and other Zionists getting closer and closer to the British cabinet and, and essentially becoming that tool that allowed for all that thinking, the British strategic interest in Palestine, the political arguments that I mentioned earlier, coming together. And so more and more British officials became convinced that it was worth making a promise so that the Zionists would help the British in the war effort. Some historians also propose the idea that the Balfour Declaration was a deceptive document, so it was all part of a larger deception plan. Uh, again, there's not really much evidence. It's true that the British in World War I and more in World War II used deceptions often to their advantage, but the reality is that we don't know much about it and uh, what we have learned afterwards is that it was unlikely part of a deception plan and more likely it was part of a set of uh, wartime agreements which proved to be extremely inconsistent with each other. And then I want to make a connection here between the traditional approaches towards the understanding of the Balfour Declaration and why was it issued. So wartime reasons, uh, misplaced ideas about Jewish identity and power, and personal reasons. And when I talk about personal reasons, I'm actually referring to what I suggested earlier, an alternative approach. So what I suggest, and more historians in the past decade or so have begun to suggest, bring more evidence, and to write about this idea, is that looking at the Balfour Declaration using a new set of criteria can give us a better understanding or a fuller picture of the Balfour Declaration. And I would argue that the Declaration is the outcome of a long-term religious debate, often connected with British policymaking in the Middle East. And I would define the Balfour Declaration as a, an eschatological work and a byproduct of a particular group of people that was in 1917, in that particular historical moment, at the top of British politics and policymaking. Therefore, I argue that the Balfour Declaration was born during the Puritan era, the Puritan Revolution of the 17th century, when the idea of a return of the Jews in the Holy Land was seen as a instrumental to the second coming of Jesus. I argue that David Lloyd George not only belonged to a particular religious group who believed in a set of beliefs ending with the second coming of a Messiah, but he managed to materialize this eschatological vision through the Balfour Declaration. Today, as back then, but today with a sort of a different kind of power, this is incarnated with Christian Zionism. Let me quote from some historians and also suggest a few readings about imperial perceptions of Palestine and this idea of connecting religious beliefs to the conquest and control of Palestine and therefore moving Jews into Eretz Israel, the land of Israel. Ilan Pape, who actually right now is publishing a book about it, but years ago, he said we should not exclude the possibility that pious Christians, such as the British Prime Minister David Lloyd George, were motivated by a wish to facilitate the return of the Jews to precipitate the second coming of a Messiah. And I remember having a conversation with Ilan years ago during a conference exactly about that and how hard it was for people like myself, like him and a few other historians, to bring about this religious argument because it's very hard to prove religious beliefs. 
So it's all about working around, trying to work on ideologies and see how ideologies can influence behaviors of individuals. Malcolm Yap, famous author of books dedicated to Middle Eastern history, once quote, said, lastly, one cannot disregard personal motives. And this is very important to understand that it's not just about politics, politics, geostrategy, geopolitics, but there may be personal motives, personal beliefs. So Frumkin, a famous author of a book about World War I in the Middle East, said, Lloyd George was the only man in his government who had always wanted to acquire Palestine for Britain. Now, maybe he did it for imperial reasons, or maybe he wanted to blend the two, imperial and religion. So in the famous book published a long time ago, by Barbara Tuckman, the first, in fact, I would say, to talk about the use of the Bible. In fact, her book was called Bible and Sword. She says, in Balfour, the motive was biblical rather than imperial. Outside the nowadays, it would be probably more imperial than biblical, but the two go hand in hand. And this is where we need to go. We need to understand that they are not contradicting each other. Religious, biblical motives are together with imperial motives. Besides, Lloyd George said himself, when Dr. Weizmann was talking about Palestine, he kept bringing up place names which were more familiar to me than those of the Western Front. And to this extent, I really want to suggest reading a couple of works that can help to better understanding this connection between Bible, religion, and the Balfour Declaration. And one, by my good friend Lorenzo Kamel, Imperial Perceptions of Palestine, and also the book by Gabriel Polly, who was a guest of a podcast, Palestine in the Victorian Age. And I certainly have all references in the podcast notes. But let me say a, a few words about Christian Zionism, because I think this is important in order to understand what might be the connection between the Balfour Declaration and religion. So early, in the early periods, uh, the, the idea of uh, the return of the Jews to the Holy Lands uh, w was very much born into the Puritan environment, probably even earlier, according to some, but it's very much around this period of time. And it's in the 17th century that we have uh, a well-established literature about Christian Zionism, literature that essentially talks about this idea of the return of the Jews in Eretz Israel and following the return of the Jews that will lead to the rapture, so sort of the breaking of the sky and the coming, the second coming of a Messiah. Now, obviously, uh, you know, this would require a lot of uh, theological explanation. Just want to mention the fact that originally, and unlike today, where Christian Zionism is very spread, particularly in America, among different kind of communities, um, in Britain was very much a, an elite phenomenon. So Christian Zionism was understood mostly by highly educated individuals. What is important is that by the 1840s, English Christian Zionism became a political force exactly because it was an idea that circulated among British politicians who did belong to non-denominational churches, so were not part of the Anglican Church. And the idea of the restoration of the Jews was included in different ways in British forest policy. And the first one, the first politician to introduce that idea was the famous Seven Lord of Shaftesbury, who was a famous social reformer, and he was also very anxious to convert the Jews to Christianity in order, in his own words, to promote the Second Coming. Again, we have to see this through the lenses politics, imperialism, and religion, and understanding that these are all going hand in hand together. Lord Palmerston, who was a British Minister for Foreign Affairs and Prime Minister later on, was the most valuable political advocate of Shatsbury Project 
in the middle of the 19th century. And Palmerston is the one who merged his ideas of his idea of religion and the second coming with the Eastern question. So how to control the Ottoman Empire, how to dismantle the Ottoman Empire without creating and starting a major war. And Palmerston argued that if allowed, the Jews in Palestine would be a barrier against Egyptian ambitions in Palestine. This is the time where uh, Mehmet or Mohammed Ali took over Egypt and challenged the Ottomans. And so we already have this idea as early as the beginning of the 19th century to create a Jewish entity in Palestine as a buffer state to make sure that the Suez Canal and the Routland to India would be protected. Now, it's important to highlight that the doctrine of the restoration of the Jews did not become a general conviction for the British people. It was spread, but not as popular. What became popular and gained white currency was the idea that sooner or later the Jews would return to their land. And this was a very popular commonplace, and evidence can be found in the press, statements, uh, popular narratives. So that is what really the British public understood, that sooner or later the Jews would have held the land. And we also have to understand that most of it was connected to anti-Semitism. The idea was like, if the Jews have a land, then they can move back there. By the 1870s, what is important to remember is that the rest, those that believe in the restoration of the Jews and these ideas were fully joined with imperial ideas and tendencies, which I call a perfect marriage. So it's only, in my view, at the beginning of the 1870s when these two ideas thanks to uh, politicians and the development of these ideas to a larger extent, they join together with the needs of the empire, with the imperialist ideas. Now, the attempt to convert the Jews in Palestine didn't really work out very well. It, an association was formed, but it also uh, failed. But nevertheless, the idea survived. And in the 20th century, eventually, that spread in the United States however, with some differences. We will talk about Christian Zionism probably in the future, dedicating one or more episodes to this, but I just wanted to focus here on the question of the Balfour Declaration, which I believe is important in order to understand the alternative approach about the motives and the purpose of the Balfour Declaration itself. As we will hear from different scholars, their views about the Balfour Declaration. I just want to wrap up a few thoughts here. Jewry, Jewish people, were perceived as a nation by British policymakers. In Whitehall, Jews were seen as a racial entity with a national consciousness and were a cohesive unit. It's important to perhaps use a comparison here Often the British would look at the Jews as they looked at the Irish. So one nation, one group of people spread around the world, but they all share in this common identity and sense of nationality. So support to Zionism, I believe, was driven by the necessities of war in Europe and in America. And the Balfour Declaration was meant to enable a global Zionist propaganda campaign to capture the support of war jewelry for the British war effort. And Zionists, more importantly, took advantage of the inconsistency and deficiencies of the British policymaking and turned the declaration into, first, the creation of a national home, which could correspond to the idea of Jewish immigration into Palestine, and then later on, in 1948, a Jewish state. So I think we should also talk about the power of the Zionist movement to keep that promise alive. And, it is, and as it has been mentioned earlier, one of the strengths of the Zionist organization was first to include the Balfour Declaration within the mandate that was created in the 1920s, so to give the Balfour Declaration legal strength and therefore make that promise 
more than that. Not just a promise, but a legal obligation of a mandatory power, Britain, to create a national home, to foster Jewish immigration. I also want to conclude saying that the Balfour Declaration is not only the byproduct of politics, strategy, military necessities, but also, as we saw earlier, of religious duty. David Lloyd George, despite being not particularly attached to the earthly Holy Land, and the chance first to restore the Jews in the Holy Land, and secondly, to fulfill a dream never achieved by the English hero Richard Coeur de Lyon, to make Palestine British. Thank you for listening to this first episode dedicated to the Balfour Declaration. You will be able to find all of the references of the various works that I mentioned and more in the podcast notes. Thank you. Until the next episode of Jerusalem Unplugged. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to support the podcast, please share it with others on social media or leave a rating and review. To catch all the latest, follow us on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook at Jerusalem Unplugged. Thanks and I'll see you next time.